Hello and welcome to this lockdown special panel discussion on achieving personal growth in the aftermath of COVID-19. My name is Mark Easton. I'm delighted to be in the, the Zoom chair for this conversation, which has been convened by the charity Bounce Forward, which helps schools teach resilience as a, a key part of students' personal development. The, the pandemic, I think it's expected to be one of those moments in history which, which reset society. There will, we're told, be a, a new normal. We'll think of the world in terms of BC and AC, before <laughs> coronavirus and after coronavirus. Now this week, of course, we celebrate the 75th anniversary of VE Day, and as part of the BBC's coverage, I've been making a film about the greatest generation, those people who were shaped by the sacrifices of the Second World War, creating a group with a, a reputation for resilience, for humility and a profound sense of duty. That's the generation, of course, that created the National Health Service and the welfare state. Every Thursday, we clap their vision. So will Britain AC after coronavirus be a country broken by social dislocation and economic hardship, seeking people to blame, demanding retribution? Or might the community spirit we've all seen up and down the country mean it emerges stronger and nicer? might we be incubating a new great generation? Well, to help us think how we can get to the latter rather than the former, how can we achieve personal growth from this crisis? We have a fantastic panel for you. Lucy Bailey. Lucy Bailey. Hello. Hello. Lucy Bailey is the CEO of Bounce Forward, doing amazing things in schools, as I said. Uh, Sophie Corlett. Hi. Hello, Sophie. Sophie is uh, Director of External Relations at the mental health charity Mind. Richard Layard. Hi. Richard Layard is Emeritus Professor of Economics at the LSE and a member of the House of Lords, famous for his work on the science of well-being. Uh, Gus O'Donnell. Nice to be here. Gus O'Donnell is a former head of the civil service who helped put happiness at the heart of Treasury and government thinking, and he's also a member of the House of Lords. Uh, David Treesman is... Uh, David Treesman. Hello. Hello, Mark. Hello, David. He's a former Labour Minister, now a trustee of Bounce Forward and a crossbench peer in the House of Lords. And finally, Saima Rana. Hi. Hello, Saima. Uh, Saima is the principal of Westminster Academy, a brilliant comprehensive school specialising in business, enterprise and science, but with a focus, too, on turning out happy, resilient and compassionate students. <laughs> our, our panel are particularly can tell on how the science of well-being might guide us on how to improve society. So I wondered if we could start by asking each of our panelists to offer a personal view on what they think the evidence on how to turn this emergency into an opportunity. So first of all, maybe um, Lucy Bailey. Lucy, do you want to start us off just thinking about how this moment could go one way or the other and what we can do to make sure it goes the right way? Sure, thank you. Thanks, Mark. So, I mean, our work at Bounce Forward really is on the teachings of positive psychology, very much at an individual level. So I start at the, you know, the, at the, the individual personal level of what the teachings of psych positive psychology can tell us about how we withstand pain and failure and setbacks and how we use that to really understand how we can deal and respond with it and make the most of the opportunities, really. And our work has been to really try and, you know, a mission to make sure that this sort of teaching and learning and the science of positive psychology, understanding how human beings respond and relate to situations and how we can teach that as a core subject in schools. Um, because I believe we have these words like self-regulation and compassion and hope. But the trouble is, is that we don't necessarily know, first of all, what they mean. And that might sound like a strange place to start, but I really believe that. And, you know, and for, and for ch children and young people to really learn and understand, first of all, what things like compassion are, but then how they can show compassion. First of all, for themselves, because we can't be compassionate to other people unless we're first of all able to show it to ourselves. But, you know, really to be and understand the mechanics in the same way that we might teach young people in maths how to add up and take away, you know, to, to subtract. So for me, the science of resilience and well-being are things that can be taught, measured and mastered in the classroom, you know, by professional teachers. And then what I believe happens is that the young people then who really are struggling with some of the 
you know, more sort of medical conditions around anxiety and worry and stress, get the help and support they need. My mm. fear at the moment is that the system is sort of clogged up with just what I would call as normal strains and worries. And something like COVID-19 absolutely highlights this idea that this is something new that we're and that, that, and that worry and anxiety around it is actually normal but that there are things that we could do both on an individual level and then collectively to really to be able to respond to make the most of this situation we've seen haven't we in the last week um figures from the office for national statistics showing a huge leap in the levels of anxiety and the levels of unhappiness in our society um uh, Richard Layard, um, your thoughts as we, as, as we sort of consider how we might be able to shape our society for the better when we do emerge from this emergency, what are your sort of broad thoughts on, 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 on what our ambition should be and the kind of buttons that the, the science of well-being says we should be pressing? Well, I think I'm one of those uh, members of that generation you're talking about. Um, and uh, I do remember very vividly the feeling of cooperation and common endeavor that existed even in the post uh, Second World War period. And I think we've got a great opportunity to recover that sense of community and communal effort, public spiritedness and living to, to, to contribute to the lives of others um, in the present situation. And that is, of course, the message of the whole well-being movement, not just to do it after a crisis, but to go on doing it. And the other message, of course, is that we do have a lot of scientific knowledge about how then to implement the goal of being useful to other people. So I would think that the most obvious areas where we would have to make big changes would be in the schools. The, the objective of schools should be uh, at least as much the well-being of the children as their academic development. And, and there are things we can say about that. Bruce has been very much involved in that. Uh, for business or employers generally, crucial that the well-being of the workers be a, a really important uh, objective of, the, of, of an enterprise to provide a, a meaningful uh, lifestyle for the workforce. Then, of course, the mental health services, really crucial that they get their proper share of NHS money, when we get away from this present crisis uh, and are able to do the evidence-based things which we know they can do, not only for anxiety and depression, but for addiction, for family conflict, all these social problems are ones we should be addressing uh, with individual help within the NHS, plus, of course, uh, change at the level of society. And then, of course, there's the government itself, the whole objective. What is the point of government? Um, we know that... Um, the second president of the United States said uh, the life and happiness of the people is the only legitimate purpose of government. I can't think why we have a government if it wasn't to produce uh, a, a, a conditions for people to lead happy and enjoyable lives. So we've got to reorient the whole process of government. Do you see this then, Richard, as, as a real opportunity? That there is a moment of reset here that we should be grasping? I think there is. I, I really do, because people are, everybody is rethinking what really matters to them in this situation. That's the first thing. There are two issues. People t tend to stress, you know, that people are having to cope, but th th there's more than that. They are becoming aware of the things which are utterly basic and really worthwhile and the things which are much more peripheral. And so I think we can create a society which is better focused on the things that matter to people. We can do that at the individual level, but we can also do it at the collective level because we've got a lot of evidence about the things which are more important and things which are less important. Okay. Um, Simon, we, uh, Richard then was talking about schools being perhaps almost the first thing we might look to to, to try and, and, and use this opportunity to create a a society in which people are, are stronger and more resilient and more socially aware. I know in your school you do place quite a lot of focus on the mental well-being of your uh, students. How do you see this moment? Do you think we have an opportunity to create a, a better society? Absolutely. I think at Westminster Academy where we we very much value mental health and well-being and happy students. Our students are incredibly happy because we do put a, a huge focus and at the heart of everything we do 
is of course the students and our promise to students is always to keep them safe secure and then successful so the exam results the acad academic aspect is the third priority for us safety and security is incredibly important and that's our promise and you'll find that on, on our website in our core purpose you know those non-negotiables of keeping them safe and secure but not all as we know schools um, will actually put the focus on safety, security and well-being as much as perhaps um, perhaps they ought to as, or as much as some really good schools out there are already doing. I think in terms of recognising the key point that we have today and where we stand today, you know, mental health and uh, well-being is so important and, and we've heard so much about it. But when the government asks um, schools to really focus on uh, specific subjects like the EVAC and the STEM subjects, then things like well-being and things like mental health and the arts, for example, all of these great creative subjects that really enable human beings, children in particular, to really grow in confidence and be able to be resilient learners, to be happy learners, to be creative, to really feel com comfortable and confident in who they are and their own environment and their own spaces it kind of takes a back seat not in my school of course but it does in some schools because of course you know regulations and um, compliance etc is, is important as well so I would I would welcome the government to really I, I think the re most important thing government can do or the Department for Education can do is really look at this time and moment and 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 moment in time rather and think what is it that got our people through? Like um, Gus said, you know, it's about keeping the population happy and safe, looking after them as government. What is it that got our people through? Well, things like the arts have got us through. Things like being mentally healthy is getting us through. Exercising once, you know, once a day is getting us through. All of these great things that allow us to be great human beings and be, be confident human beings. These are the things that are letting, getting us through. So why don't we have something like mental health and well-being on our curriculum? Why don't we have some space for it whereby we can really um, value it and parents will value it and children will value it and they'll see the importance of it because at the moment it's very much about um, looking at specific subjects that really take out the creative element um, of learning I think so I think it's a really great opportunity for us to relook at our curriculum relook at what we're doing in terms of education at Westminster Academy we offer the International Baccalaureate and part of the back International Baccalaureate is, in, is the IB learner profile and part of that learner profile is about being risk takers, about being caring, about being knowledgeable and working with others. So a school like Westminster Academy is going to really prepare its children to, to get through this period of anxiety and uh, mental sort of um, health and well-being um, you know, issues and concerns. But schools that aren't looking at these things and haven't been training, educating, valuing these aspects, they're in a bit of trouble at the moment. Um, and we, we can see what's happening at the moment in terms of mental health and well-being and anxiety, the reports and, and the newspapers, what they're showing and, and, and so on. So I think we just need to refocus. What as a society do we value? Do we value um, academics and do we value results and do we value kids um, being incredibly successful through a core curricula that somebody has chosen for them or do we value healthy fit happy human beings who are able to really enjoy fulfilled lives and have great qualifications because I'm not saying it's a choice between the two at Westminster Academy there is no choice we do both and I think it just makes us a, a stronger population a stronger group of people um, I think it's incredibly important that we rethink our curriculum at the moment. David Treesman, um, uh, Richard mentioned the, the importance of, of business grasping some of these uh, ideas as well post lockdown, that they start thinking about the well being of their staff <laughs> in a different way. Perhaps, you know, in, in a more general way, what we are seeing in our communities right now are, are, are little acts of kindness which are being played out every every day and every night um, as people deliver food parcels and do all of that companies have to think in very perhaps in new ways about the welfare of their of their people as well what are your thoughts are you, are you an optimist or a pessimist about the, the sort of opportunities that we, and challenges that we have you know when at last this this virus is behind us well i think temperamentally i'm uh, an optimist i probably always will be <laughs> Uh, although uh, intellectually I think we've got to be very careful about the period we're going to go into. Uh, not only will we have uh, an economy which will have suffered significant damage, but it is possible, in fact in my view, likely that uh, other factors like 
the uh, rupture of the relationship with Europe might mean it's very much harder to get back to any kind of stable economy in any reasonable amount of time. And as an economist, I, I'm, I worry about that. But when you started, you, you spoke of the uh, unusual features, as, as Richard did shortly after as well, the unusual features of the uh, wartime generation. Uh, I think that's absolutely right. And one of the things that's always intrigued me is that in the period directly after the war, people were prepared for not only a good deal of hardship, but also for quite a lot of central command in the economy and in the way in which we developed our social structures. They were prepared to put up with it. They'd probably become used to the idea in wartime and in the reconstruction period, they were prepared to live with it as well. And it was a mixture of things, you're right, the health service, a lot of the welfare state, but also the way in which um, some of the national industries were harnessed toward the social good, even if that uh, later turned out to be an inefficient model. So I think that we should be looking at a whole sequence of things which may have an impact. And I've rather more hope that they will have an impact on younger people than on people who are going to be grumpy about the economy, because there'll be plenty of those. Now, uh, just as, a, as kind of quick examples of it, I know Seamus School um, well, and, and everything she said about it is completely justified. It's, a, it's an amazing place. I think that the prospect, for example, of schools adopting certain kinds of local priority and continuing to work with perhaps more isolated old people, uh, making sure that the open spaces are very much nicer, that many clubs, sports clubs included in that uh, last. But I also think, and it's one of the reasons that I was attracted to Bounce Forward, is that um, if you think about what life is like for kids in general, there are some who get diagnosed as having various kinds of problems, but the reality is it's quite tough being a kid there's stuff going on all the time home isn't always wonderful whether you've been put on some spectrum or not it's not always uh, wonderful so the idea of having a toolkit and schools beginning to create much more widely than uh, the, than uh, the, the one school we've quite rightly heard about today but create a toolkit so the kids can um, reach into that toolkit and do the things that they need to stay very much more resilient would be very important i think that will be accentuated uh, for two reasons at the moment, quite aside from the things that are going on anyway. The first is, of course, the kids will be coming out of COVID-19 as well. And I don't know that this is the last pandemic we'll see. There's lots of bugs out there in, uh, in animals that can jump species. We've been pretty lucky that they've been in isolated bits of Africa, but they won't necessarily always be. We, we will have to come out of COVID-19. And the second thing is that loads of kids, whether they're in uh, year six about to go to um, to secondary school or that they're uh, at, at the top of their schools and they're about to go to university are going to go through transitions which will give them a bit of a kaleidoscope shake up as well and we need those kids just to be able to handle all of that without it becoming uh, an increasing layer by layer difficulty yeah. so I think we've got to think very hard about how we help all kids <laughs> and help, how we help them get post this period and how we help them get through transitions. That's a big, big task, but absolutely essential. And I think we can bring that off. Okay, Sophie, call it from my mind. Um, I mentioned earlier the figures from the ONS, um, perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, suggesting that there's a, been a very significant jump in anxiety and unhappiness in Britain since, uh, since the lockdown. How do you think that we can ensure that, that that isn't the legacy of this emergency and that we can uh, produce a, a more fulfilled and, and happy society? Yeah, I think we need to look at the structural as well as the individual implications here. And um, the work that we've been doing, we've uh, surveyed about 9,000 people um, since lockdown. Um, sort of week by week collecting evidence of how things are changing for people and what uh, people with and without mental health problems and what's very marked is that pe for people with mental health problems things are m very significantly worse for them um, and and uh, people with some diagnoses in particular and and it's it is partly to do with the circumstances of lockdown and feeling increasingly 
uh, uh, much more than others, the levels of loneliness and disconnectedness, but also very practical problems, how to get food, because they will have fewer social connections, more likely to live on their own, how, how to get their medication and being unable to get access to their normal services. So attention and funding being taken away or people being ill or services normally being face to face. So we, we are, as, as the weeks go by, people are becoming less and less well in some circumstances. And actually um, we see that more broadly across society with uh, you know, people developing problems and um, uh, some of them which aren't problems, they're very natural reactions to circumstances, bereavement or loneliness, but some of which will without support become problems, but also people who already have mental health problems actually being quite at the bottom of the pile. And I think there has been during this period an interesting focus that has popped up every now and then. Most of the focus has been on, you know, people can't get flour or, uh, you know, how to develop a new hobby or those sorts of, you know, nice things that middle class people can, who've already got a home and a garden and all those other things can think about and how they can build their resilience for the future. But actually there have been stories and I hope that there is increasing focus on um, those people that are, that that are only just getting by in normal circumstances and how this additional hit financial or support being taken away has really knocked them back. And if, as a society, we can take this opportunity to, to see where we have left people behind and use the opportunity to say, okay, purposefully, we're going to invest there, we're going to see what can be done, um, to bring people back up so that, you know, when David, the next pandemic does come along, we will genuinely all be in the same boat, mm -hmm. not some of us in a one boat and some of us in an, another boat. David, Mark, can I just add something? Yes, very quickly. I'm just going to say, if you don't mind, I, I totally agree with what Sophie's just said. What I've realised, I mean, I knew it before, but what, what's been really, really apparent, and it, it sort of hits you in the face, that a lot of these stresses that are being identified as being caused by COVID-19 are actually stresses of poverty and uh, pos uh, stresses of living in, ad in inadequate housing, poor access to amenities, food, healthy lifestyles, mental health, well-being. What I've realized more than ever, and it's really, really, just really highlighted the, 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 the difference between, and it's not just the digital divide, it's just a, there is a genuine divide. And I think it's, 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 it's I, I know we're talking about post-COVID-19, but it's about looking back and looking at pre-COVID-19. Actually, these stresses have always been there. Um, but it's just not affected everybody. It's affecting everybody now because people can't leave their homes, but they're in their gardens, like Sophie said, you know, they've got these sort of, it's, I don't want to go on about it too much, but it's like these really lovely sort of middle-class um, sort of environments that they're living in. But actually the stresses have been here for a long time and, and they're related to po poverty and, and, and deprivation. And I think we just need to be really aware of that. I think it's a really good point that Sophie just made. Oh, okay. Yeah, and I was going to, I was, I would add as well that, um, uh, and this is a really uh, significant point for resilience. It's not just poverty, but it's your experience to date. So your childhood experience, which is why schools are so important, but also your home experience. So if you live in, if you live in poor housing or your family's experienced debt, that is a real setback for you. If you've been a looked after child or experienced abuse as a child, those have long term mm -hmm impacts on you and I think one of the things about the greatest generation post-war is that actually as a society everybody voted to say okay it's not good enough that people are on the bottom mm -hmm. we're going to have a system that picks up on children that have had a bad time we're going to have a system that provides health services that provides you know it wasn't a perfect system there wasn't mental health services you know we all know you know it's we've been able to improve things since then but some of those things actually we have rode back on and if this gives us an opportunity to identify that actually that was a mistake to row back on some of those things I think that will really have been a useful learning maybe not worth the cost because yeah, it's been very okay, maybe bring in, in, in Gaza Donald here because one of the things about this crisis of course is that exactly as people have just been saying um, sort of parts of of, of British life that had been rather 
forgotten um, suddenly become to the fore. The, the people who were clapping, the people who we are regarding as our heroes, um, things like social care, which had been sort of put on the back burner of the back burner, mm. uh, suddenly uh, full square. And I wonder from your perspective, um, you know, reflecting on, on this sort of central question here about how we might be able to shape a better world after COVID, how we might get government, or, or perhaps it's already happened, maybe we are going to see a government with different priorities. H how, how do you think we should, we should go about making sure that uh, they don't forget the lessons they've learned during this crisis? Well, I think the first unusual part about this crisis is we go into it with, with one great advantage, is that everything people have said about schools, about mental and physical health and all the rest of it, we are able to make evidence-based statements about those because we have data started collecting data comprehensively, the ONS, about a decade ago. And so we can now analyze these things. So as, as was said, these things aren't new, you know, poverty and things like that, we know uh, being unemployed, these things matter a lot. And the lockdown has emphasized a number of these things. For example, the importance of community spirit, the importance of volunteering, helping others, massively important factors not necessarily helped by the way the government's handled it, to be perfectly honest. You know, if I look at the mess messaging, um, you know, everybody knows about social distancing. It's a term I hate, right? I think we need to preserve the idea of physical distancing and social togetherness. That social togetherness is massively yeah. important. To be fair, isn't that one of the interesting uh, phenomenons of this whole crisis is that um, we thought we were going to be isolated and actually we discovered we were much closer together than we ever realized. I, I certainly feel that in my community. Perhaps I'm unusual. Well, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out in very large cities. And, uh, you know, when, when you're incentive and you're, you're being told every day, keep away from people, you know, block off those normal forms of channel, wear masks, do not communicate, you know, keep away. And yet, at the same time, we are, as you said, clapping the NHS. We are massive numbers of us volunteering. So there's a contrast there. And the second part I'd, I'd emphasize is governments are going to have a real challenge as they come out of this, because we are gonna try and keep the best parts of community spirit and the rest of it. You know, People will be asked of businesses, you know, that question that came up, we related to the Second World War. What did you do in the war, daddy? You know, very sexist, I might say, but, you know, what did businesses do during the war? What did individuals do? You know, I think we should all, in a sense, be held to account. Did we try and get something good to come out of this? And I think that's massively important because we already know we are going to have one of the biggest factors that negatively affects well-being massively against us for the next few years, and that's mass unemployment. Right? Yeah. That, the solving the mass unemployment getting incomes back up is going to be hugely important. And that's something government is going to have to play a big role in. It already is putting money at this, but actually we already know that lots of people, if nothing is done, will lose jobs and will not get back into those jobs for a long time. So hopefully government will start to take this wellbeing agenda that Richard and I have been pushing them to have as the centerpiece for a long time, to take it seriously. You know, what we've heard already, if we were measuring well-being in schools, uh, if we were taking that really seriously, if we were spending money on preventing problems rather than curing, you mentioned about the health service, the NHS and social care and the like. I hope we'll come out of this saying one of the best things we can do with the health service is keep people away from hospitals, um, you know, and manage this whole set question of prevention. Uh, we are doing some things with communities which are building a spirit, which means crime goes down, which means helping each other. These are preventative things. So I think there is a much better world that can come through it. If politicians can pick up on this feeling that the public will have that, you know, let's, let's not return to normal, let's return to a new normal, which is better than the one it was before. But I think we have to be careful and think about what we'd like to happen as opposed to what's likely to happen. I think if we don't do anything, chances are we might revert to exactly where we were before. So we need to take this opportunity to change things quite radically. If it be at schools where we say, actually, 
we need to put well-being at the heart of all schools. There are some brilliant ones, uh, obviously Westminster, that's brilliant, but you know, more, uh, we need it to be comprehensive. We need to take mental health much more seriously. And there's some very clear messages for government. And if they go back to where they were before, then I feel we may have lost the opportunity that this terrible crisis is presenting to actually get government on a better footing to really care about the well-being of everybody from children upwards. That concern that we are going to be facing such huge economic and social consequences um, and that actually government, you know, they, they will not, the first thing on their, on their piece of paper at the top is not going to be the word well-being. I mean, we can try and put it there, but isn't, isn't the reality, Lucy, um, that actually this is going to be a really uphill struggle. Of course, we'll want to you know, continue with the good things that have happened during uh, social distancing or, or physical distancing um, and, and, and social togetherness. But the reality is we, we're going to be facing a long period of, of, of very intense uh, economic problems and the social problems that go with it. And it is going to be mighty difficult, is it not? to prevent that from turning into, you know, well, unhappiness. Well, you know, for me, people think about well-being as something, you know, that is easy. You know, I, 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 I talk about resilience all the time. I, over the last month, I've, I've been in, I've, we, we, I've run seminars for about 600 parents from all different walks of life, both targeted groups of those that, you know, have, whatever the indicates we give around, you know, so, so social, you know, low economic deprivation, all of those things. And I've been having conversations with them about how they look after themselves, how they build resilience in themselves and how they help their children respond to this situation to the best. But it's not easy. I think there is a thing of us thinking that well-being is about feeling good all of the time. Actually, good well-being <coughs> recognises that I am going to get some more long term well being. I will feel more achievement in myself if, in the short term, I do some things which are really difficult. So, for me, you know, we think of well being. I get told all the time, you know, we, we've been running research projects for the last 10, 11 years, you know, trying to provide the evidence of how this type of teaching and learning can really make a difference. And all the time I get told these are soft skills. I completely disagree with that. These are core fundamental skills that human beings need to understand, to relate to one another. And if we're able to do that, we can really do some really remarkable things at real low cost. We're not necessarily talking about, you know, but this is what frustrates me sometimes. We were talking earlier about um, children who suffered really difficult situations, for example, in the looked after system. I started off my career working with teenagers who'd been looked after and my role was supporting them into independent living. The outcomes for children who've had the most terrible start in life can be really huge if they just get the right support at the right time but this is not really you know big rocket science type things these are simple things conversations that you can have helping them understand what's going on psychologically getting them to understand what is normal for them in terms of how they feel and then giving them some really you know evidence-based strategies that help them problem solve their situation it's not necessarily easy but it enables people to take a step forward and for me if we are faced with huge unemployment and real challenges that is life and we are going to have to find ways at an individual level and yes then collectively the things that we can do at a more national level but to me yeah there is so much that we can do at an individual level and it's really quite simple and it really doesn't cost a lot of money and you know that's what can be just a bit frustrating Yes, Richard Laird. I just wanted to take up what you said, Mark, about there are going to be so many problems, how would we get these ones anywhere near the top? Yeah. I mean, after the Second World War, you know, there was a reduced standard of living. It was, life was tougher after the Second World War for five years than it was during the war. It was a really hard time. There was incredible shortage of foreign exchange, etc., etc. That was when we created the National Health Service. Uh, that was when we created the welfare state. During those years, the, the toughest years economically of all for the British nation. So I, I don't think we, we should at all accept that the economic difficulties are an excuse 
for not doing something great, um, if we can persuade this, this government to do it. But I don't think it, it doesn't rely entirely on the government. I mean, the schools could take advantage of things that are, have happened. Actually, the government has done something rather remarkable. As far as life skills and schools is concerned, they've made it compulsory. It's called relationships, health and sex education. They haven't said how much it should be, but they've said it should be compulsory. What an incredible opportunity for schools to take hold of and say, look, we are really going to change the values of our school system and we're also going to teach life skills, uh, relationships, health and sex education every week in a serious way based on evidence. And they're going to all come and queue up for Lucy's wonderful course called Healthy Minds. I also think that there's a, a huge opportunity for organizations, citizens organizations that have been based on trying to develop within a secular context in a slightly post-religious age, the, the, the idea of community values and living for other people, uh, which are really important and have come to the fore during this period because people have lived undoubtedly in a more altruistic way during this period than they normally do. There's a huge, been a huge amount, as I think I've said and others have said, um, of, of voluntary activity to help other people. So I'm thinking, for example, of the organization I belong to called Action for Happiness. I mean, this is an organization where people gather regularly around the great issues of life, not only how to be happy themselves, but how to make other people happy. They're pledged to try and create as much happiness as possible. They take a course which has been shown to transform their own happiness and their compassionate uh, feelings towards other people. These are the kind of things which, for which this environment should be the, the seedbed for organisations like this to flourish, and I think I they will. Be, I want to be really practical just for a moment. I know that Richard and Gus, you've been working on trying to think how you might actually mm. provide a, help, help government with a kind of roadmap to a, 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 a better Britain. Gus, perhaps you could just explain, you, you've been working on, really, a, is it a sort of metric, basically, about how we could measure whether we're doing the right thing or the wrong thing? Yes, indeed. If you think about the kinds of decisions governments having to make, for example, how and when do we exit from the lockdown? There are lots of variables going on. So if you exit too early, uh, there might be a resurgence of uh, the virus, you might then get back to more people suffering from it, more deaths, etc. On the other hand, the longer the lockdown goes on, the more there are going to be problems, uh, physical and mental health issues, loneliness, uh, the economy is going to be battered, so the consequential loss of businesses, unemployment is going to be higher, all of those different things. And how, how and, and there's other aspects like domestic violence, on the one hand negative, on the other hand some uh, in London, some nicer air quality, uh, some lower deaths from on the roads, things like that. So there's a whole bunch of different aspects. How do you bring them all together? How do you use a common currency? And what Richard and I and others were suggesting was that we use a concept that we call well-being years. So we actually know from having the data, having done the studies, the impact, for example, of being unemployed on your well-being, which is pretty dramatic, as Simon was saying. The, the, the consequences of low income, uh, the consequences of mental health issues. Um, uh, but we also know the, that you know, there's nothing worse than dying. So you know, we need to manage the disease as well. Unfortunately, so you, you need a framework that brings these together. We, we use a metric called well-being years, which is a kind of variant, I would say a rather better variant of something that's used quite a lot called qualities, quality adjusted life years that NICE uses, for example. But well-being years allow for the fact that the average person's overall life satisfaction is around seven and a half. With a wellies, adjusted. wellies, huh? wellbies, what are we going to call them? Wellbies, I think we call them wellbies. Wellbies, so I, I'm all for wellbies. So, so we can calculate all of this in, in the concept of well-being because in the end we are making these life and death decisions. People don't like to talk about it too much, but that's the reality of government allocation of funds. And that, that approach presumably, yes, it might help us guide us out of lockdown, but presumably it could also be applied to government in, in all respects going forward. What, where do we want to put our money? Absolutely. And, and what, again, Richard and I did with our all-party parliamentary group was to look at, uh, I mean, it got delayed in the end, the spending review. 
you know, when we come to the next spending review, which I imagine will be the autumn or maybe even the spring, and we look at how government allocates out that money. Now, we've learned, you know, there are a lot of key workers who are pretty low wages, which are pretty much set by the government. Uh, we could do something about that. We could do something about the investments that we need to prepare ourselves for future crises, not necessarily pandemics, because it might be something other than a pandemic. So there are lots of things. We could look at the lessons learned from this episode on well-being. The, you know, the point that resilience in kids will turn out to be really important. Well, some schools were doing this and some were making sure, making a big thing of, oh, we got so many exam results, when in fact, if they've got really good resilience, they get the exam results anyway. So, you know, I, I think we could, with that next spending review, say, what do we really care about as a society? This is brought home to us in kind of life and death terms. It matters to all of us. We now realize how much it means to us to be able to have those social interactions with our loved ones, to be able to have a certain income, certain style of living. And that, uh, as many people mentioned, the inequalities in this are very dramatic. You know, that this is really hurting some people at the bottom. This government came into this world with a leveling up agenda. Through no fault of its own, we've got the COVID virus, which has actually destroyed that. It's, it's hit low income people dramatically. Uh, they are going to be hurt much more by the consequences, the economic consequences of unemployment and businesses going bust. So if we care at all about leveling up, we're going to think about those groups who've been really badly hit um, you know, our, our care workers, for example, you know, they're at the front line on all of this. Hopefully we can do something to redress those imbalances, but also do it in a sustainable way. So to think about what are the lessons, is that, co lessons that come out of this, of things that are really important. And I, I'm, I'm, afraid, I'm completely with Richard that the place to start with this is the schools. If we get this right for individuals, they have the right sense of values, of resilience, of community spirit, that stays with them through their lives because, as we've seen here, brilliant teachers are already doing this. David, as a veteran of government, I just wanted to get your thoughts, actually, on, on, on how, if we are going to say, all right, this is a real opportunity, we've got, we've got the, the, the evidence, uh, we, we, we know actually pretty well the kind of things that we should be prioritising, and we should be measuring it all in in well-bees or some other um, some other equivalent metric, um, is this just pie in the sky? Can we really convince the great machinery of government to, to 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 turn into that in the same way as you know Formula One teams can suddenly become the manufacturers of ventilators? I, I suspect it might be easier to get Formula One teams to become the manufacturers of ventilators, but I wouldn't mind us trying. Uh, you know, I, th I think some very important points were being made earlier about what people's life experience is like at the moment, which flows in the opposite direction to Welby's. I mean, I, I, I grew up on a grindingly poor estate in North Tottenham. I can remember why people thought it was um, as harsh as it was, because it was harsh. And you knew when somebody had lost a job and you knew when somebody had lost a relative and you, you all kind of knew all of these things about each other because you lived in each other's pockets pretty much. Uh, but I think that there was a, a greater kindness, uh, a greater willingness to help out if people were in difficulty. And I think some of that has been washed out of our system and it would be very important to see ways in which we could reinsert it. Let me just give one practical example. It is only an example, nothing more than that. Uh, one of the reasons that so many of our es essential workers, and we've learned, goodness knows, in the last weeks, who's essential and who isn't, uh, in many respects. One of the things about our essential workers is that they've been in a period of declining uh, incomes. Their relative incomes have been going down. They, uh, in, in some cases, even with, say, nurses in Northern Ireland, to get any kind of uh, improvement, not that they've wholly succeeded, they've had to go on strike. Nurses going on strike. We adjust what we pay people uh, in terms of whether we can have industrial conflict to do it. I can imagine a very, very serious review, uh, rather like we had at different times, a serious review in 
um, in health and in education, in care, in a lot of areas where there were much, much more mature ways of making sure that the differences between incomes at the top and at the bottom were reduced and that there was a fair way without having to have conflict of deciding what those incomes should be. Now, some people said, well, you know, that's not, that's not compatible with operating in terms of market forces. I suppose I'm making the point that it's not conspicuous to me that marking market forces have been fantastically successful in a fair allocation of incomes to people. And I think that there would be a very strong case for government to say, we've learned something about fairness during this period. We've learned something about what happens to people who are at the bottom or feel they've got to fight for everything. And we're going to do something about that. I think that all of that could be done and done relatively easily. Uh, I know there were, there were experiments, Richard would probably know about them. There were experiments in whether there could be schemes of that kind at the LSE. And I know firsthand there was a, a lot of detailed work done at one stage in Cambridge. Of all places, it was very elite universities doing work on these things, but uh, doing work on them because they were absolutely necessary. Mm. Sophie, we lost you there. I'm glad, hopefully you're back. Um, yeah. Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. So yes, you were, you were sort of thinking about how we can boost our well-being. Yeah, so I think there are obvious things that can be done. There can be things that can be done um, uh, across the country around, particularly around financial, I think, security and housing security and some of those very basic things to do with um, how everybody lives. I think schools are really important. Um, and keeping people in school is really important and um, very aware that for people with mental health problems, their likelihood of being excluded or indeed off-rolled um, uh, are really high. And, uh, you know, that sort of start in life where actually some schools are looking after the well-being of the majority at the expense of the minority, that is not the way to go. We need, and I think one of the things that maybe we can take away from this is that we actually need to look after everybody it isn't acceptable to leave some people behind. That affects us all when we do that as a society. But I also think that we need to be much more aware of intervening early for people. And so that, that's a personal thing for people that they seek support early, that they feel less self-stigma about admitting that, you know, I'm struggling, I need some help and I'll, I'll ask for it. Um, but also that as a society, we are more able to uh, intervene early. And I think one of, the, one of the sort of vicious circles we've got into a little bit with our mental health services is that we intervene late and then people's well-being has really reached a point at which it's very difficult um, to build back. So you may have lost a job or a relationship or a house and it's so much more difficult to get back after that. So early intervention, I think, and I, if we're wanting people to come forward earlier, we need to be able to respond earlier. And I think that would help for younger people. It would help in workplaces. Uh, you know, it would, it, would, it would just mean that things keep turning you know, it keep turning around for people and means they can get up. A really interesting study has just been done by um, people from 34 different countries around the expected recession that the world is going to be facing after this. And uh, we have pretty much always seen mental, big mental health impacts from recessions, including an increase in suicide and getting their heads together uh, across the world. They have identified that that is not inevitable. Um, if we intervene early enough. Yeah, Richard, you wanted to come in. Well, I was just going to say that what's remarkable is that there's much, much more talk about mental health uh, by government ministers and the public generally, and yet the percentage of NHS spending that goes on mental health hasn't changed for the last 20 years, although they always say it's one of the top three priorities. This has got to be the moment when we really attack this this fixity in the spending on mental health because there are going to be all the people traumatized we've got good trauma services but they're simply not available there's all the domestic violence we've got good treatments for family conflict they're simply not available there's a big increase in addiction going on massive increase in alcohol consumption going on at this very very moment uh, diminished services 
for addiction over the last two or three years, um, good psychological treatments, must get them available. How can we? I think we need a real campaign now as, as a feature of this uh, emergence from the lockdown, a real campaign to get the government, not just to talk about mental health, but actually to do something about it. Child mental health above all, it's going incredibly slowly, the rolling out of mental health support teams in schools. Yeah. Well, this, this, is a, this is a moment where we really have to push this. Yeah, huh. Sorry, I know this is yeah. something you will feel passionate about too, this, the, the importance of making sure that our children actually have the support that they need as they're developing. Absolutely. I mean, I think I agree with what the panel is saying. Um, I think, you know, there needs to be a real political commitment that after this crisis, there are going to be dedicated um, funds that are going to be allocated to all the things that we're all saying are very important at the moment, whether it's the NHS, whether it's teaching staff, whether it's our social care workers. You know, I have to say as a teacher myself, because uh, first and foremost, I'm a teacher rather than a principal, I would say, um, and a very good one at that. But um, as, as a teacher, you know, there was a piece of research done by the Varki Foundation 10 years ago um, to see how much we respected, how much did the society respect and, and, and think their teachers were great. And I think it was, I think it was just China, actually, I think it was China that thought that their teachers were um, almost second to doctors, but the rest of the world just didn't, um, didn't appreciate teachers. You know, they were low paid, you know, if you can't do, then you teach kind of thing, these jokes and, and all of this. And, you know, I think it was just last year, I know that um, Lord Traisman just said in, in Ireland, the NHS um, uh, nurses, but last year, I think in the United Kingdom, nurses were striking because of this pay increase and et cetera, and teachers about to fight for, forever for a pay increase. So I just think all of a sudden, it took a global pandemic to show us who our essential key workers are, who are the people that are really uh, the engine room of a society. And I think that, although it's not a nice situation, I think the optimist in me thinks that it's great that people are recognizing that actually our essential workers are these people. So that's my first point. My second point is that at the moment, social and emotional care for students is not prioritized. I, I agree with what um, Richard said about um, the RSE curriculum, which is amazing, and it comes into force in, uh, in uh, September 2020. We must teach, and it's great. It's really given us a real sort of uh, push towards making sure that we're teaching it. Most good schools already are, so Westminster Academy was already um, looking at that and teaching it. But it's one of those things, the old saying, what um, gets weighed gets measured, right? Um, and that's the, way, that's the right way, isn't it? And so, um, so, and it just feels that at the moment, and Unless government, it's really difficult for schools and teachers, unless government says, you know, it's okay. My school doesn't do that because I'm quite brave and I will go out there and do what I need to do. There is an issue here, isn't there, about parents and what parents want. And we've, we've talked about parent power and we know that the reality is if you're running a school, if your parents are saying, look, you know, forget all that, you know, re resilient stuff. Just make sure that my kid gets their A-levels because that's the thing that's going to make them get them into university. Now, we've heard the evidence that actually it, it, it might be that the resilience is, is the positive, but convincing people is not going to be easy. But I think, somebody said it earlier, and I, I forgive me, I forget who, but if you are resilient, if you are mentally fit, not because you've got mental health problem, but you're mentally fit, you will get the results. Westminster Academy is doing that. We're getting the results because actually we're looking after the well-being of our kids. You know, what's, what's really terrible is, as a principal, I've got a list of children who need a counselor, who need some mental health and well-being, professional support, right? And the system is not looking after them. The country is not looking after them. So as a principal, what I've had to do is for the past five years, I've had to go out and fundraise for counselors. I've had to do that in my own time fundraise for counsellors and every year, thank you God, we have fundraised about 80,000 pounds because of some really great businesses, some really great people in our society. And we have been able to offer a rolling program of counselling services to our children. And as a result- You've actually had to raise that money yourself. Yeah. Well, that's, that's extraordinary. Gus, I, I saw you waving, you wanted to come in on this point too. Well, yes, and uh, no, I, I totally take that. The question is, why should it be different as we come out of this? Why were the politicians you know, who, um, clearly, you know, over various parties, not managed to make this well-being the centerpiece. And I think if you think about where they traditionally measure themselves, you know, the success measures, GDP growth, uh, reductions in unemployment, all those sorts of standard things. Well, I can tell you, I can guarantee you 
by those standard measures, this government, this parliament will fail, right? There's no question. It's not, that's one of those predictions you can be completely confident about. And it's not their fault because of this external shock, but we know that that's one of the consequences. What better time then to say actually what really matters? If we actually were able to improve the well being of the people of this wonderful country, wouldn't that be better? And wouldn't it be better if we started to change some of our values? As David said, you know, there have been various commissions that have looked at reasons why we have um, got the structures we've got. And we know that market economies produce, you know, quotes, efficient results, but they don't produce good results in the sense that they can be distributionally terrible. Mm -hmm. So it is now a time for us, I think, to be thinking with a government that said it cared about leveling up to actually say, look, politically reset the goals. You failed the normal ones. You're never going to win on those. What is it that really matters to you? And hopefully we'll have a prime minister who's kind of stared the end of his life, you know, clearly and helped massively by NHS workers to the extent that he names his child after them. That to me, if they follow that through and say, so what's the spirit behind that? How could we do push that to the whole of society, then you start going down the route of saying, we're actually going to care about the well-being of our nation. Okay, well, uh, rousing thoughts from Gus O'Donnell, uh, and we've pretty much run out of time. So I thought just to finish, um, I'd find out, um, well, where your well bees are at the moment, I'm going to ask you about your sense of optimism. As I said at the beginning, we do have, I suppose, you know, two broad ways in which our country could go. Uh, the, the, the first and perhaps the most obvious is that the enormous economic shocks that Gus has just been talking about actually make it a very difficult time for this country with a great deal of unhappiness and hardship uh, and difficulties and mental health challenges. Um, and the other is that somehow we do uh, manage to, uh, to harvest some of that uh, community spirit that we've, we've seen growing around our neighbourhoods over the last uh, few weeks. Uh, so I think just a simple show of hands. I'm just I'm going to ask it in the positive way. So I would like you to put your hands up clearly if you are optimistic that we will come out of this uh, uh, and be a stronger and better and happier country uh, in the future. Hands up if you think that. Mm. Uh, <laughs> there's a bit of dithering. Well, look, there's the challenge. There's the challenge. We have to prove the doubters wrong and, uh, and we have to find a way of doing the best we can. This is clearly a watershed moment for the world and indeed for our country and our society. And all we can do is just hope uh, that many of the things that you've been saying, the important things that we do know about strong societies, can be turned into the kind of thinking and policies and behaviours uh, that will make Britain a better place. Uh, thank you to everybody who's uh, listened to this uh, panel discussion. Thanks very much indeed to Bounce Forward for making it all happen. Thank you to our panel, to Lucy, to Simon, to Richard, to David, to Gus, and to Sophie. Uh, and, um, and here's to a better Britain, everybody. Thanks very much and goodbye.